M S W Media. Big shout out today to Helix Sleep. Take their two minute online sleep quiz and they'll match you to a mattress that will give you the best night's sleep of your life. Find a perfect mattress and up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows at helixsleep.com slash daily beans. Hello and welcome to the Daily Beans for Wednesday, January 18th, 2023. Today, an ex-GOP official is arrested in shootings at homes of Democratic New Mexico officials. Critics demand an investigation of Trump's disturbing Saudi golf payments. Some of the Trump White House visitor logs are revealed. And a political aide accuses Matt Schlapp of groping him. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Dana Goldberg. Hello, Dana. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday to you. You are glowing and beautifully done up because you had a wonderful day where? I was at the White House today for the uh, Golden State Warriors celebration of their championship in 2022. It was amazing. Uh, I got to meet and see, I got to see Kamala Harris and the second gentleman. Uh, I got to meet Nancy Pelosi. I got to meet Eric Swalwell in person. I've met him like virtually a bunch, but I got to meet him in person today. And then, of course, uh, I got to meet a whole gaggle of Golden State Warriors, which was the coolest thing. (laughs) It was awesome. That's awesome. awesome. It was really awesome. Better than frog orgies? Uh, Yeah. You know what I'm going to have to say? It was better than that. Okay. Good, 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 good. Because some of them could be listening. I just want to make sure you gave the right answer. Yeah. (laughs) You can check my feed at Mueller. She wrote for some of the photos from the day. Uh, But it was absolutely uh, wonderful. And I was honored to be invited to that. Uh, So thank you very much, POTUS. I appreciate you. Uh, And he was he was making some jokes. It was awesome. He it was it was really good. So thank you again to uh, to everyone and the White House. I appreciate you. Truly an honor. All right. We have a lot of uh, really disturbing news, I have to say, in today's show. So I'm going to give a blanket sort of content warning because there's kinds of all sorts of violence and sexual assault. So I just want everyone to have a heads up for that. We'll give individual content warnings as we get to the stories. But there is a lot to get to. So let's hit the hot notes. Hot notes. All right. Content warning for violence. The authorities in Albuquerque. Dana, this is your hometown. I know. Just gross. This is just terrifying. They said on Monday that a former Republican candidate who lost his bid for state house in uh, November has been arrested in connection with a series of recent shootings at the homes of four Democratic elected officials. Chief Harold Medina of the Albuquerque PD said that at a news conference, the former candidate, Solomon Pena, was the mastermind behind a conspiracy in which four other men were paid to shoot at the homes of two county commissioners and two state legislators. Mr. Pena, 39, lost the election on November 8th in a landslide to an incumbent Democrat, Miguel Garcia. Days later, Pena went on Twitter to express support of Donald Trump's 2024 presidential campaign and to say that he had not conceded his state house race. Chief Medina said that the SWAT team took Mr. Pena in custody on Monday. The police said they planned to charge him with several state crimes. It was unclear if Mr. Pena had a lawyer. Carter B. Harrison, an Albuquerque lawyer who represented Mr. Pena last year, did not immediately respond to a request for comment Monday night. The police said in a statement, Mr. Pena had paid four men cash and sent text messages with addresses where he wanted them to shoot at the homes. Mr. Pena accompanied the men to the house of State Senator Linda Lopez on January 3rd and, quote, attempted to shoot, but the automatic rifle he was using malfunctioned. Another man shot more than a dozen rounds from a handgun, the police said, including into the bedroom of Ms. Lopez's daughter. Shell casings found at Ms. Lopez's home matched the handgun that was confiscated after a traffic stop just 40 minutes after the shooting. The driver, Jose Trujillo, had an unrelated felony arrest warrant, the police said. The car, they said, was registered to Mr. Pena. The recent shootings in New Mexico began on December 4th when someone fired eight rounds into the home of Adrian Barboa. That's a Bernalillo County commissioner, and that's according to the Albuquerque police. On December 8th, shots were fired at the home of State Representative Javier Martinez. Three days later, on December 11th, a shooting targeted the home of another Bernalillo County commissioner, Debbie O'Malley, and then came the shooting at Miss Lopez's house in early January. Just December 8th, December 11th, and then a few weeks later uh, in early January, 
at Mrs. Lopez's house. And the authorities have been investigating six shootings, six that targeted Democratic officials. The police said on Monday they no longer believe the shootings in which Mr. Pena has been implicated were related to reports of shots being fired near the former campaign office of the state's attorney general this month and at law offices of the state senator in December. Gilbert Gallegos Jr., a spokesman for the Albuquerque Police Department, said in a news conference that Mr. Pena visited at least three Bernalillo County commissioners and Mrs. Lopez, the state senator, at their homes in November after he lost his election. Garcia defeated him decisively, winning more than 73 percent of the vote, Dana. Quote, he had complaints about his election. He felt it was rigged. That's what Mr. Gallegos said of Mr. Pena. He approached all of these commissioners and the senator at their home with paperwork claiming there was fraud involved in the elections. Mr. Gallegos said the lawmakers were puzzled and surprised by the accusations and that one confrontation led to, quote, quite an argument. The shootings occurred shortly afterward, Mr. Gallegos said. That kind of suggests why they were targeted, perhaps, he added. The Albuquerque Journal reported in July that if Mr. Pena were to win his state house race, he would be blocked from taking office because of a criminal record that included burglary and larceny. The journal reported that Mr. Pena had served nearly seven years in prison after a 2008 conviction for stealing from big box stores. I stand with Donald John Trump, Mr. Pena told the newspaper in a text message after declining to answer questions about his criminal record. I don't want anything to do with you, he said. Two lawyers who represented Pena in the 2008 case could not be reached for comment. A spokeswoman for the New Mexico Corrections Department did not respond to a message seeking details about Pena's criminal record. Months before the November election, Garcia asked a New Mexico court to bar Mr. Pena from appearing on the ballot because of his convictions. The court ruled in Mr. Pena's favor, saying that a state law that bars felons from holding office unless they are pardoned by the governor was unconstitutional. As for the recent shootings, the police said on Monday that their investigation would continue. Kyle Harstock, deputy commander of the PD's homicide unit, said Monday the police, quote, have somebody who is involved inside this conspiracy who is talking to police. That person, he said, helped confirm that Pena was at the January 3rd shooting. Harstock said that Pena had hired others to carry out at least two of the shootings and that Pena had texted the addresses of the shootings in one case just hours before the shooting took place. The continuing investigation would involve, quote, more warrants and interviewing more persons. We're not at the end yet, Harstock added. The police said in their statement that search warrants were executed on Monday at the home of the two men who were allegedly paid by Mr. Pena. And Pena's arrest comes amid recent increases in threats and attacks against elected officials from both parties and is yet another illustration of the danger that elected officials in the U.S. face as violent political speech increasingly crosses the line into in-person confrontation. Last year, Dana, an armed man who had repeatedly showed up outside the Seattle home of Pramila Jayapal, was charged with stalking. A visitor smashed a storm window at Senator Susan Collins' home in Bangor, Maine, and an intruder broke into the San Francisco home of Nancy Pelosi, as we know, and attacked Paul Pelosi with a hammer. But Pena's case is different, at least in part, because he had been a political candidate until just weeks before the New Mexico shootings. Mayor Tim Keller of Albuquerque said that the news conference on Monday, he said at that conference that the police had discovered what we had all feared and what we had suspected. Keller, a Democrat, described Pena as a right-wing radical election denier and said that he had done the worst unimaginable thing you can do when you have a political disagreement, which is turn that to violence. That should never be the case, he said. Absolutely horrifying. All right. AG, a pro-democracy group formed by supporters of slain Washington Post reporter Jamal Khashoggi is calling on the Justice Department to investigate former, the former guy, former President Trump's payments from Saudi Arabia-backed LIV golf tournament to host their events at his properties. And this has been reported from Newsweek. This is a quote. The democracy for the Arab world now, otherwise known as Dawn, that group has called on the Department of Justice and Congress to look further into the disturbing facts and circumstances surrounding the controversial golf tour and its ties to the former president after new details on its funding were revealed as part of an ongoing lawsuit filed by the PGA against LIV Golf. And this has been reported by Ewan Palmer. And the quote goes on, on January 13th, it was revealed during court proceedings that the Saudi Arabia Public Investment Fund, PIF, a sovereign wealth fund headed by the country's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, owns 93% of LIV and pays 100% of the costs associated with his events. This is from the report. And they went on to say, Don claims this is the first time that the full extent of PIF's ownership of LIV golf has been disclosed. Well, Sarah Lee Whitson, the executive director of Dawn said in a statement 
the revelation that a fund controlled by Crown Prince MBS actually owns almost all of LIV Golf means that MBS has been paying Donald Trump unknown millions for the past two years via their mutual corporate covers. Now, MBS, Mm -hmm. I know, we all knew that there was something, but it's Mm -hmm. amazing to actually read this. MBS, who has long sought to create a more liberal image (laughs) and brand for Saudi Arabia publicly, has simultaneously doubled down on repressive policies, most notoriously ordering the murder of Khashoggi in a Turkish embassy, although he, of course, he denies the involvement there. Now, the LIV event has been broadly accused of being a public relations stunt to whitewash Saudi Arabia's human rights record, which is abysmal. Mm -hmm. Trump is not alone in profiting, by the way, off this Middle East venture within his family, and this should surprise no one. His son-in-law, Jared Kushner, also received $2 billion dollars from the Saudi Wealth Fund for his own investment company with MBS approving the deal over objections from his own fund managers. Yeah. This family is so fucking deep into this. It's mind blowing. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and now I've got to wonder how Elon and Twitter are pulled into this. Absolutely. Honestly, with all the Saudi backing there and how much MBS owns of Twitter at the moment. All right. Another content warning. This has to do with sexual assault. Matt Schlapp, the guy who made the CPAC stage shaped like a Nazi symbol. Oh, yeah. Head of the nation's largest conservative advocacy groups and advisor to Donald John Trump was accused in a lawsuit on Tuesday of groping an employee on Herschel Walker's Senate campaign in October. A lawyer for Mr. Schlapp, Charlie Spies, denies the allegations, saying in a statement, the Schlapp family is suffering unbearable pain and stress due to this false allegation from an anonymous individual. No family should ever go through this. And the Schlapps and their legal team are assessing counter lawsuit options. Yeah, go for it. Discovery will be fun. The lawsuit filed in a Virginia circuit court in Alexandria accuses Schlapp of aggressively fondling the man's genital area in a sustained fashion while the two were alone in a car. A staff member filed the suit anonymously, citing privacy concerns and fear of retaliation, given Schlapp's influential position as chairman of the American Conservative Union which hosts the Conservative Political Action Conference, the old CPAC. A staff member, a longtime political aide in his late 30s, detailed his allegations to the New York Times on the condition that he not be identified. The accusations were first reported this month by the Daily Beast. Go Daily Beast. The lawsuit also accuses Schlapp and his wife, Mercedes Schlapp, who served as Trump's White House Director of Strategic Communications, of defamation and conspiracy, claiming that they coordinated a campaign to discredit the Walker aide and his allegations. Timothy Highland, a lawyer for the accuser, said in a statement that the lawsuit, which asked for at least $9.4 million in damages, has been filed in part because Schlapp has not apologized for his despicable actions. Quote, because Mr. Schlapp has refused to own up to his misbehavior, this suit aims to make Mr. Schlapp and those who lie for him accountable for their actions and statements. In his statement on Tuesday, Mr. Spies, who is also representing Mrs. Schlapp, accused the Walker aide of, quote, working in concert with the Daily Beast to attack and harm the Schlapp family. Mr. Schlapp, who's 55, a former aide in the G.W. Bush White House, rose to prominence as an ardent public defender of Trump. He met Miss Schlapp, 50, when they both worked in the Bush administration. They married, had five daughters, and during Mr. Trump's tenure, became one of Washington's most prominent conservative couples. The lawsuit accuses Schlapp of defamation by pointing to Mr. Spy's initial statement that described the accusations as false. (laughs) Sound familiar? Oh, yeah. The lawsuit, yeah. The lawsuit argues that Mr. Schlapp defamed the Walker staff member by telling neighbors that he was a troubled individual. Sounds like what Trump says about E. Jean, who had been fired from previous jobs for lying and making false statements on his resume. The message was shared on a group text with neighbors, the plaintiff said. The lawsuit says the plaintiff has not yet been fired from a job for lying or for lying on his resume. He had not, I shouldn't say not yet, he had never been fired from a job for lying on his resume. According to the lawsuit, the plaintiff was assigned to drive Mr. Schlapp to a Walker campaign event on October 19th in Perry, Georgia. That evening, after returning to Atlanta, Schlapp invited the staff member out for a drink. The two men met at Capitol Grill, where they chatted about sports and then drove to a second bar, Manuel's Tavern, about 25 minutes away. At the second bar, Schlapp sat unusually close to the staff member, according to the lawsuit, which claims that his leg was almost in constant contact with the aide's leg. Mr. Schlapp encouraged the staff member to have more drinks, which made the staff member uncomfortable. The staff member turned away from Mr. Schlapp to watch a baseball game on television, and Mr. Schlapp asked why the aide would not look at him. The staff member said that they had an early event the next morning and offered to drive Mr. Schlapp back to the hotel. 
On the way home, Mr. Schlapp allegedly grabbed the staff member's leg and crotch inside the car while the staff member drove to Schlapp's hotel. The episode left the plaintiff frozen with shock, mortification, and fear from what was happening, particularly given Mr. Schlapp's power and status in political circles. After returning home, the staff member spoke to friends about the incident. He made multiple videos about what had happened, according to the lawsuit. Thank you so much for that, AG. Now, Donald Trump, speaking of sexual assaulters, Donald Trump spent his time in office fighting the release of the White House visitor logs. Well, then came January 6th Select Committee. In late December, the committee uploaded hundreds of documents as it wrapped up its exhaustive investigation into the attacks on the Capitol. Now, tucked into that release was an Excel spreadsheet detailing seven full days of Trump's White House visitor manifests. Those logs capture key moments pertaining to the January 6th probe, such as the Oval Office meeting on December 18th, in which outside advisors, including Sidney Powell, Patrick Byrne, may discuss the prospect of seizing voting machines. They also offer a glimpse into dozens of other guests that Trump was hosting during the final chaotic stretch of his presidency from December 14th, holiday reception featuring governors, Fox News personalities and donors, to the December 18th Oval Office visit by country music singer-songwriter Lee Greenwood, whose music was a staple at Trump rallies and his family. Now, the logs are not exhaustive. They only deal with a small period of Trump presidency, and they don't include the specific purposes of the visits or details identifying the visitor beyond his or her name. So, for example, many people are listed as having met with Trump on December 14th in the White House residence, though it's likely they were in attendance at a larger holiday party. While some of the entries contained in the January 6th Select Committee's publicly released document, they've been removed to address potential privacy concerns. In addition, we also removed records of White House tours, which was a significant portion of the data, but rarely involved a visitor of public interest, save for very specific instances, like, let's say, the tour taken by the Proud Boys, the Proud Boys chair Enrique Tarrio, and that was on December 12th. The visitor logs include the dates December 12th, 2020, December 14th, 2020, December 18th of the same year, December 21st, January 3rd of 2021, January 4th of 2021, and January 5th. While some visits were publicly known at the time, others can be understood through the context in which they occurred, coming amid the COVID pandemic while the White House was shedding staff in anticipation of the transfer of power, at least among those outside Trump's inner circle. But even these limited snapshots provide a window into how Trump's White House actually operated, with an eclectic mix of guests, political and apolitical, sifting in and out. Now, for example, as five members of then-Rep Devin Nunes, California, his staff on the White House Intelligence Committee were ushered into the West Wing to review documents Trump intended to declassify. A wholly different set of guests were being brought into the building's East Wing. So this was happening simultaneously, and as January 6th approached, a number of artists and photographers stopped by the president's personal residence, the purpose of which remains unclear. So mm. there's a lot of gray in here and a lot of mud to work through with these logs. Yeah, yeah. And if you want to see that, that story comes from Kyle Cheney and Paula Friedrich at Politico. And if you Google that story revealed who visited the Trump White House before January 6th, they have the logs for you to review on Politico's website. So definitely check that out. Uh, we have the good news coming up, and I'm very excited about it because I really would love some good news today. If you have any good news, you can send it in to us at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Stick around. We'll be right back with it in just a minute. After these messages, we'll be right back. Hey, everybody. I wish you all had the chance to sleep as well as I do on my custom Helix Sleep mattress. You can. You just go to helixsleep.com slash dailybeans, take their two-minute sleep quiz, and they'll match you to a customized mattress that will give you the best sleep of your life. Because Helix understands that everyone is unique. So they have several different mattress models to choose from. They've got soft, medium, and firm mattresses. Mattresses that help you cool down when you get hot like me. And they even have a Helix Plus mattress for plus size folks. When I took the Helix quiz, they matched me with the Helix Midnight because I wanted a medium firm mattress and I prefer to sleep on my side as the whole Western world knows now. It is the best mattress I've ever had in my whole life. And it's been great seeing unboxing videos from so many of you who also found the Helix mattress of your dreams. So if you're looking for a mattress, go take the quiz and order the one you're matched to. And the mattress will be shipped right to your door for free. It even comes with a 10-year warranty and you get to try it out for 100 nights, no risk. Helix is amazing, but you don't have to take my word for it. They were awarded the number one best overall mattress pick of 2020 by GQ and Wired Magazine. And right now, Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners at helixsleep.com slash dailybeans. That's helixsleep.com slash dailybeans for up to $200 off your mattress and two free pillows. 
Everybody, welcome back. It's time for the good news. Who likes good news, everyone? Then good news, everyone. Good news, good news. And if you have any good news, confessions, corrections, if you want to play What the Mutt, you want to give a shout out to somebody you love, a shout out to a small business in your area. If you want to talk about a pet that's for adoption in your area, if you want to do shit kids say or shit you say or shit your parents say, or if you want to talk about how you mix up idioms or if you have a fun swear that you've heard recently uh, or, you know, anything, you know, resembling the stories from the charismatic mega plastics episode, we definitely want to hear from you. You can send your stuff in at dailybeanspod.com and click on contact. Now I'm going to kick us off, Dana, with uh, a submission from an anonymous person, pronouns she and her. Hello, beans, queens. My name is Mally, and I'm, a, oh, I guess she's not anonymous. I'm a longtime listener and fan here from Charlotte, North Carolina. I wanted to write in to tell you all about our newest pet, Monroe, a.k.a. Roe for short. She's a rescue we found through an amazing woman-owned rescue organization here in North Carolina called Forgotten Now Family. Monroe was abandoned in a shopping cart in a pet store by her awful POS old owners. Her uterus was literally hanging out of her when she was abandoned Aww. in the cart, so she required immediate medical attention and surgery. Forgotten Now family found her and got her all the help she needed right away. Fast forward a couple months when we met Roe at a brewery with her foster family and immediately fell in love. She's absolutely loving her new life with our other rescue dog, Cash, and is the sweetest, most loving little girl. If any listeners from the Carolinas are looking to adopt a new pet, please give Forgotten Now family a follow on Instagram or check out their website. Our adoption process was so easy and wonderful. And these women do incredible work rescuing the precious fur babies across the state. Here's a picture of Roe. And please check out Forgotten Now Family Rescue on Instagram. Thanks for all you do. Look at Cash, though. Oh, woof. Oh, Oh my gosh. So adorable. Oh, my God. Roe is so cute. Thank you for, for sharing. This is such a great story. All right. So it's called... Forgotten now family. Forgotten now family. I get it. I love it. Oh my goodness. Adorable. 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 All right. This is from Jack. Pronouns he and him. I've been listening to you since I heard you on Virginia Heffernan's Trumpcast podcast way back then. You two are among my favorite podcasters. Well, thank you, Jack. I don't know how you stay sane researching and reporting on all the evil deeds of the Republican MAG crowd day in and day out. You're like the middle-aged sin eaters who consume (laughs) sin so that we can be absolved. So thank you for all you do. On MLK, let's remember the old arc of moral universe bends toward justice saying, hopefully we will see convictions this year. I wanted to give you some good news about our cat Willow. Two days before Christmas, my wife was wrapping gifts when a thin 12-inch long red ribbon fell on the ground. My wife noticed that Willow was eating it and started chasing her around the house and couldn't catch her until it was totally consumed. Apparently, ribbons are really dangerous as they can form an obstruction or even saw through intestines if they are not passed. We ended up in the emergency vet for four hours where they did an x-ray and induced vomiting, but no luck. We were faced with a $4,000 endoscopy, a possibly $10,000 operation, If she became obstructed, we decided to wait, and lo and behold, on Christmas morning, we received a lovely gift, wrapped poop tied in a red ribbon. (laughs) Oh, my God. Thank you, by the way, for not actually putting that photo (laughs) in as your pet text and actually just giving us a picture of the cat. I thank you. I love that it came on Christmas. (laughs) So funny. Willow, don't eat ribbons. Look how cute Willow is. All right, next up from John, pronouns he and him. I've been mishearing Merrick Garland. At the top of the show on Cleanup Aisle 45, I always thought Merrick Garland said the rule of law is not just a lawyer's Turner phrase instead of turn of phrase. (laughs) A few weeks ago, I had my duh moment or do moment, uh, but I thought I would share this with the pod of beans. Like AG, I too was in the Navy. I get used to speaking in acronyms and I know that lawyers also have their own lingo, so I thought nothing of it and assumed a Turner phrase Came from some obscure lawsuit like Turner v. I'm a dumbass. (laughs) (laughs) In all seriousness, I recently moved to Wisconsin. And uh, although the midterms are in our rearview mirror, we have our next big fight on our hands. Yes, yes, John, I've brought this up. April 4th, we're going to elect our next state Supreme Court justices, which will either enshrine our gerrymandered state until 2030 or give our state a fighting chance for fair representation. One amazing company called 
Minoqua Brewing Company, who sells beers named AOC IPA, Bernie Brew, and Extinct Elephant, among others, <laughs> started its own super PAC with the goal to drive up turnout for this election that is expected to have a record low turnout. Currently, they're attempting to raise $44,000 in order to erect billboards all over the state backing the best candidates. I cannot stress how important this is to our state and to the country. For those that are interested, I will leave a link for the campaign and remember to support local small businesses that are fighting to make the world a better place. Minoqua so Brewing Company. Good. Thank you. Indeed. All right. This is from Adrian Grace, pronoun she, her, also an AG. Hello, Bean Queens and Leguminati. I have an admission. The first time I listened to your podcast was a week or so after the leak about the Dobbs decision. I thought news was swearing. I'm in. In that first episode, I was so impressed listening to you break down the important stories, especially the legal stuff, into something we non-lawyers could understand. That said, even with the necessary swearing, it still felt pretty depressing. And then you got to the good news segment. That's when I hit the subscribe button. I love hearing people's stories. Fun, funny, some so heartfelt and touching. I eventually became a patron so I could enjoy the pet pics as you read their stories. Finally, it's my turn to share something good. After three years of learning about digital accessibility, I passed my certification exam. Oh. My husband will tell you he knew I was certifiable when I married him. <laughs> well done. Mm -hmm. What the heck does it mean to be a certified accessibility professional? Thank you for answering my question. It means I do everything I can to ensure my clients' websites and digital documents are accessible to everyone, including those with disabilities. The world is a better place when we include everyone. Last, I'm including two pictures of my pod pet text. One is of my favorite two cats lounging in the sun. Amber Noodles is the tabby sitting up. Abby is the tortoise stretched out on the floor, irritated that the sun has moved. The other pet photo is our friend's dog, Costas making himself at home on our sofa. Do we call him our part-time dog as we bring him to our house when our friends go out of town? Thank you, Beans Team, for all you do and for your amazing audience that reminds me there are smart, kind people everywhere that see bullshit for what it is. Oh, yeah. Look at that cat who's, who's no longer in the sun. Mm. Uh -huh. <laughs> amazing. Oh, look at the pupper. Cutie. Hello. Oh, so adorable. Costas, I love it. The part-time dog. I know. I actually love the name too. So adorable. Thank you for sending that in. And thank you. I'm so glad that the, I mean, I love the good news segment too. So I'm with you, the other AG. All right. If you have anything you want to send in to us, please do so at dailybeanspod.com. Click on contact. I am traveling tomorrow. I will not be here. Uh, Dana, you are going to be taking over the steering wheels of the beans. I completely forgot. And now I'm sweating, but I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm ready to go. Uh, should be fun. Should be interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm on, I'm on planes all day tomorrow, so uh, I won't be here, but uh, we will definitely get you some beans. I promise. Do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here? Uh, no, just Godspeed. If someone can please send some <laughs> help and maybe a little bit of alcohol, we'll get through tomorrow. Everything's going to be fine. <laughs> it's going to be just fine. It's, it's your birthday present to me. My birthday's on Friday, so. That's right. It's the yeah. least I could do. I will not be 50 yet. <laughs> it's on Friday. <laughs> I'll be as close as you can get to 50 without turning 50. So ah, last year, my last year in the 40s. Yeah, make it a good one, though, my friend. A good trip around the sun. I will. And you know who else could help me make it a good one? Jack Smith. So yes. come on, if you're listening, Jack, if you're listening, please, some 2023 indictments would be so choice. I would love that as a birthday gift for this year from before Let's I do turn it. 50. All right, everybody. Uh, Dana, we'll be back in your ears tomorrow. See how this goes. <laughs> Jesus then. Christ. Just don't unsubscribe. That's all I'm asking. <laughs> everybody, please take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Take care of the planet. Take care of your mental health. Vote blue over Q. And take everyone with you. I've been AG. And I've been DG. And them's the beans. The Daily Beans is written and executive produced by Allison Gill with additional research and reporting by Dana Goldberg and Amy Carrero. Sound design and editing is by Desiree McFarlane with art and web design by Joel Reeder with Moxie Design Studios. Music for The Daily Beans is written and performed by They Might Be Giants and the show is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, please visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media. You voted. I did. You protested. Again. 
You postcarded. So many Sundays. You posted on social media. Got some likes. And you're still reeling from all the terrible news. Yeah, but what else can I do? I'm Kelly. I'm Lila. And we're going to help you figure that out. Each week, we'll interview people on the front lines of political action about the things they actually did to take action. What got them started, who helped them along the way, and what they'd do differently if they had it to do all over again. And in the process, we'll give you concrete advice about how to take the leap from freaking out on Twitter to making a difference. Follow What Can I Do wherever you listen to podcasts or tune in on whatcanidopodcast.com. Podcast.